So I put together some notes. Basically, they were just from reading the Bible, reading the book of Revelation, and seeing the churches. Jesus addressed the churches, that mid part of Revelation, because he tells John to write down the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things, right? Metatalta, that, that Greek word. So the things that are, that was present tense. That's when John was there, right? And he has them write about these seven churches. They were physical churches in Asia Minor, which was modern-day Turkey, that area. And it was basically the Roman Empire of that time. And it was spreading. The church was spreading. But these particular churches Jesus picked to show a picture, a foretelling of what will be church history. I believe that strongly. And I took some notes down on it. Bear with me. I'm reading off of this. But watch this. So Jesus is the letter to the churches, the seven lampstands. Remember, he said the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And are those churches there today? No, they're not. Most of those churches there in Turkey aren't even there. Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and all these different churches are not even there. So it was a foreshadowing, a telling of what would be of church history. So Ephesus, John was with Mary there. And Jesus tells them that they stayed true to the, uh, you know, the teachings and the doctrine, but they lost their first love. They were, they were losing the love that they needed to have. And he reprimands or corrects them for that. He still loves them and, and they're, they're still his church, right? And then we see Smyrna. There was this man named Polycarp. He was one of the early church fathers and he was martyred. And this is the place, uh, that, that was, uh, it was very um, Romanesque, I should say. It was a, it was a lot of the Roman. Uh, they they wanted people to worship Caesar as Lord, and Polycarp refused to do that, and he was martyred. Pergamum. This is where Jesus said the seat of Satan was, which is interesting because Pergamum is the place where the Nazis. Like if you're into Raiders of the Lost Ark, this is really cool because this is an actual place where the Nazis went and discovered it was this this big shrine to the false god Zeus and there was these other false gods there as well and the Nazis absolutely loved this place the Germans in fact the the there's a there's a museum in in Berlin Germany you can go to today with this all the artifacts of Pergamum rebuilt inside of this museum Hitler loved that place by the way there was a few other people that loved it I think Obama went and visited that place specifically for some reason but the seat of Satan, Jesus said, was there at Pergamos. Zeus was was his his statue was erected by that evil Antiochus Epiphanes, right? Back in the Greek Empire, way back before Jesus, like 167 BC before Christ. They erected the statue of Zeus, and Zeus was that supreme god of this place of Pergamos, and Jesus referenced that as the seat of Satan. Well, later the Nazis designed Nuremberg, their place where they had these big rallies and all that stuff, right? And the actual place, they did a reproduction of Pergamos there in Nuremberg. And the actual place where, where Hitler's podium was, was where Zeus's statue would have been. Wow. Pretty amazing stuff, right? So that's Pergamos, or Pergamum, the church of Pergamum. Then there was Thyatira, and then there was the church of Sardis. Some say that was like the pro, the um, the Reformation, the, the Protestants, the Protestants, right? They were protesting. What were they protesting? They were protesting Catholicism, the, the extreme Catholicism. Now, there's a lot of Christians that are Catholic, okay? That's not what I'm talking about here. Jonathan Rumi, very Catholic, okay, but also very born again and Christian, follower of Jesus. But the church before that, the church of Thyatira, many scholars believe that could have been the picture of the Catholic church. So then we, then we had Sardis, and then after Sardis, which would be the Protestants, the Protestants, they were protesting, right? The Reformation, all that stuff, right around 1517 AD is when that happened. Then we have the church of Philadelphia. Now, the evangelical church came about after those Reformed churches, like the the Lutherans and all these different things that came out of the Protestant movement. So we see the evangelicals, with guys like Billy Sunday, who brought helped bring Billy Graham to faith. Billy Graham being, I think, 
the Church of Philadelphia, which means the Church of Brotherly Love. Chuck Smith, the Calvary Chapel movement, the Jesus Revolution. If you haven't seen that movie, go see it. I believe that this was all speaking of that Church of Brotherly Love. And the reason I believe that is because typically the evangelical churches have supported Israel. Billy Graham supported Israel. Chuck Smith was a strong supporter of Israel as well. And Jesus gave that parable where he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And he was speaking in reference to the end of time. And he was speaking of those who watched over his brethren. Who are his brethren? Well, there's you could come away with two conclusions. His bloodline family, Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people. Or you could say the Christians are his brethren. Or you could say actually both. And I believe it's both. I believe that we have been adopted in, grafted in, like Romans chapter 11 says, into the body of Christ. And we, you know, into that that olive tree, which is speaking of Israel. But we, the body of Christ, his bride, are grafted in. Just like Joseph had a Gentile bride, but it didn't make him any less Israeli or Jewish. He was still very Hebrew, very Jewish. The son of Jacob, Joseph. And he had a Gentile bride, and she was grafted in. That's what I believe that speaks of. So the Church of Philadelphia is spared from this hour of trial that's coming upon the whole world, it says in Revelation chapter 3, this letter to this church from Jesus. Then after that, you see the church of Laodicea. Laodicea is spit out of Jesus' mouth. He's, He's saying you have hot and cold mixed together. It's almost like evil and good mixed together, and I can't have that. And he spits them out of his mouth, tells them to repent. In other words, to turn to him. He knocks on the door. He's not even in that church. He's knocking on the door to get into this church. Well, the name Laodicea, that evil guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, I just told you about, he was this antichrist type of guy who erected a statue of Zeus in the temple, killed hundreds of thousands, 80,000, some estimates are, of Jewish people. He was an evil antichrist type. Well, his bride was named Laodice, and that's where Laodicea was named after, Laodice. Wow. But now back to the Church of Philadelphia. God said there's an open door. Jesus said there's an open door to them that no one can shut. That speaks of the rapture, I believe. They have little power. They followed his word. That's something that the evangelical churches are known for, following the word of God. They have not denied his name. Because you have kept my word, Jesus said, I will keep you from the hour of testing or tribulation, you could say, about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on earth. Wow. What does he tell the other church after this church? He says, repent, be zealous. I stand at the door and knock. He wants to get back into that church. He wants to still save them. So these seven churches do not exist today, my friend, but they get a they get a warning from Jesus. The only one that doesn't get a reprimand, uh, a correction, a rebuke is the Church of Philadelphia. I think there was one other. Maybe it was the uh, Church of Smyrna as well, the persecuted church, the early, earlier one. But uh, that's what we see here. It's amazing, right? And, and uh, it's amazing that God has shown us this in the book of Revelation. It's a book of prophecy. That means it's speaking of the future events. Isn't that amazing that God gave us that in, this, in his amazing word, the Bible? This is his words, and that's why it's powerful, sharper than two, any two-edged sword, and it cuts down to the heart, down to the bone. This is God's word. Cherish it, my friend. This is why this channel is dedicated to the whole Bible, the, both the Old and the New Testament. And you can see a playlist right here, How to Find Jesus in the Old Testament. I encourage you to click on this and check it out right now.